Rabbi Chazaku Baruch, such beautiful words. So nice to see your face. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you too. I see you every day, but you know, I don't have a chance to actually extend Baruch Hashem. Thank you so much for everything that you do, really. Uh, I got to tell everybody that, you know, we know that the, the big the big challenge of these days, the Este Gaon Mevilna, the great, the Gaon, the great one, what is the most difficult mitzvah in the Torah? What is it? And uh, he said, you know, the hardest mitzvah in the Torah is during Sukkot to be happy the entire holiday. That is the hardest mitzvah. Hold on, I just see one thing here. Much better. To be happy all seven days. Now, I'm going to be very, very frank with you, very honest. I started unbelievable. Every year, Sukkot time, there's always one or two people that for whatever reason, they come very late to the sukkah. And this year I was prepared to not get nervous. In fact, in fact, I preempted any nervousness or upsetness by setting aside two halot for this, this person and his wife. Baruch Hashem, he used to come to my house as a guest and now he has a wife. And I set aside a separate cup and a separate bottle of wine for him. Okay? And I said, no problem. No problem. It's fine. It's great. And we waited. And we, we waited a little while. And finally, it was time for him to start his, uh, his own separate kiddush when he came. I stayed happy. Everything was okay. And then came the guest. Now, what guest am I talking about? This is the guest that says the most blunt things that you would never imagine they would say. Never imagine. And she looked at me straight and she said it. She goes, wow, you got some gray in your beard. You got older. You're really getting older. I can't believe it. And I'm, I'm just going to stay happy. You're not going to make me not happy. That comment will not take me down. That will not do it. No way. No way. And then a few minutes later at the table, this is Maseh Shehaya, by the way, in the sukkah that we're, I'm sitting in right now, there was a fight between a few of the children about who sits where and why they sit there and how come they should sit in that spot. And it got so bad that one of the children knocked over uh, some food and it got on one of my daughter's dresses. And there was a lot of drama. I mean, I'm sure there's no ladies in this class tonight, but we know that ladies sometimes could be a little dramatic. Um, and these young girls were very dramatic. So they came to me, they started, I'm gonna stay happy. No, you're not gonna get me. But I want to tell you that yesterday, I finally broke. I lost it. I was not happy. I got grumpy. I got upset. And Ma'aseh Shehaya, as I came close to my sukkah, the sukkah fell to the ground. It fell to the ground. And I'm looking at it and I'm saying, wow, Hashem, you're talking to me. This is unbelievable. I'm coming close to the sukkah and the sukkah fell. I had to rebuild the sukkah because I got angry. Because when you don't get the message of Sukkot, you will get angry. If you have the message of Sukkot, you won't get angry. Nothing will get you angry. Because this world is just a temporary place. It's a corridor to the next world. And you're fine. But when you forget that message, you just smack down the Sukkot. So, you know, we always, you know, we're talking about Corona. I'm sick of talking about Corona. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm done with it. It's, 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 it's something that took over our minds and it's a very dangerous thing. Not only are we talking about it, but it, it, it has governed every aspect of, of how we act. And what's dangerous about that is that we're forgetting some of the most basic things like just being happy, just taking a walk, just enjoying the air. We're forgetting these things and we got to come back to it. It's really, really important. It's really important that we come back to being happy people. And I, I just want to tell everybody here that this is Zman Simchatenu. This is the time of our happiness. And the time of our happiness is a time when we go out of the house. We go into this little hut. We go into this little sukkah. 
We go into a place that's just, you don't need anything. We don't need anything to be happy. You just have yourself to be happy. You have Hashem with you to be happy. I have a neighbor, and um, when I first got married 24 years ago, um, yes, next year is going to be a very expensive anniversary. And I got married, and I moved right here on East 2nd Street, at 1075 East 2nd Street. And we were looking for an apartment at the time. I was 19 years old. Um, yeah, and my wife was also 19. She was from Deal, New Jersey. And we were looking for an apartment. We were going to just get married. I was still in college and things like that. And she was getting a job somewhere. I'm just young, starting out. And we rented an apartment right here at 1075 East 2nd Street. And our tenant, our, I'm sorry, our landlord were the Zydels, Mr. Phil Zydel and his wife, Adina. And they looked at us and they were a little worried you know, how they're going to pay the rent. It was $700, the rent for a, a two bedroom, small apartment, but beautiful. And um, it needed a little bit of work. So we, we said to them, listen, give us the apartment. We're going to fix it up. They said, sure, you got it. And we went ourselves, we painted ourselves and we fixed things ourselves. And we were just so happy. We had no table. I remember getting takeout. I think it was Chapanash. I think it's still in business. I don't know. And um, just, just sat down. I think we sat on the floor. Or we sat on a couple of boxes or crates. Just happy. Those are the happiest times of our lives. Those are the most beautiful times of our lives. And I'm, I'm speaking about that because that is what we have to remember. To be just happy with the most simplistic things of life and not let these little quarrels, these little comments, they should not get us upset. You know why? Because it's just temporary. We just, it's just a temporary world. It's just a place where we need to work on ourselves. Just as a side point, so we bought the house next door, Baruch Hashem, like 20 years ago. And Phil Zeidel was a very instrumental person helping us get this house. And I'm just going to tell you the story. I have no idea why, but who cares? We're on Zoom. I'm also sick of Zoom, but it's okay. I'm getting no feedback. I'm talking to myself in a sukkah and just seeing my own face. But there was a person who lived in this house right next door connected. His name was Frank. And Frank was an Italian man. He had an anchor in the front and he built ships and he was retired. He was one of the most toughest people you ever met in your life. He did not like anyone in the world. In fact, somebody once blocked his driveway, which is now my driveway. And he simply put the car in neutral. He had an Oldsmobile. He put the car in neutral, he put, he floored the gas and then put it in reverse to just bash the car out of the way. Uh, a person once came to his door and rang the bell asking for food and he came back with a gun and he put it in his mouth and said, that's the only food you're going to get here. That's Frank. Okay. You got it. And now Frank puts his house up for sale and uh, I'm 19 years old. I just started renting a house. I, I don't know what's going on. Little do I know what's going on. And Frank rings the bell. And he says, I like your wife. You, I don't know about you, but I like your wife. I want to sell you the house. He said, I don't even know how to buy a house. I don't know. He goes, you get a mortgage. I said, I don't even know what a mortgage is. I have no idea what you're talking about. And sure enough, for some reason, he was pushing and pushing. And I finally bought the house. And my neighbor were the Zydels. Mr. Phil Zydel passed away uh, during Cholamoyed. He was 80 years old. And... Um, he helped me very much in my life. He did a lot of things. And he was a happy, happy person. He was a person that was happy with nothing. Whatever he had, he was happy. He didn't need much. Always a smile on his face. That's not easy. It's not easy to always be happy. And being happy does not mean a fake happiness. It means internally just to be a happy person. No matter what goes on. The shul opens, the shul closes, the wife's happy with you, the wife's not happy with you, your husband's doing great, your husband's not doing great, your kids are getting along, they're not getting along. But, but how are you inside? Are you a happy person? Where does that strength come from? Where does the ability to be happy come from? Where? There's only one answer. When you understand that you're put in this world, you're put in this beautiful world, and it's a temporary place for you to develop yourself. Whatever happens, you realize that it's necessary for your development. You don't feel upset about it because you'll say to yourself, you know what, I need this. 
This must be a part of why I'm here. It must be part of what I'm trying to develop. So you're not upset. You might be frustrated sometimes. It might be difficult sometimes, but you're happy. You're happy because you know you're getting somewhere. Did you ever see a guy running a race or a marathon and get upset that he feels tired or sweating or it's difficult? You never saw why? Because he's working towards a goal. If you're working towards a goal, you're happy because you know it's for something good. I said this, Mashal, in the daily Hizuk, but I'm going to say it again because I've been repeating it over and over again to my family and to myself. You know, the Chavot Alevavot speaks about the Mashal. The Mashal is of a man who was on a boat and there's a shipwreck. There's a shipwreck. For whatever reason, something happened. The boat collapsed. Whatever it is, he's now in the water and he's swimming. He's swimming. He's just trying to survive. He's trying to make it. And finally, he gets to an island. Now, when you get to that island, I mean, you don't know what to expect. Are there animals, other things? Who knows, right? All of a sudden, there's drums. There's drums. There's, there's dancing. The king is here. The king is here. He's looking around. Where's the king? Where's the king? Wow. No, you're the king. I'm the king? Yes, you. We are crowning you king. The next thing he knows, he doesn't know what happened. He's on this, like, throne being carried with these two sticks on either side. They're throwing all types of jewelry at him. He has a crown on his head. He's got a big robe. He, he's, people are singing for him. He, he doesn't know. He went from an hour before on some boat trying to get a trout fish to like becoming the king of an island. I mean, this is just amazing. And he's like, wow. He gets to this kingdom. He's in this royal throne. He has this beautiful, beautiful castle. He has servants. He wants to lift his arm. They lift it for him, put it down, whatever he wants. He's, he's like, he's just using the system, by the way. He goes, uh, I want right now 12 steaks and I want onions on the grill and I want Cabernet Sauvignon from 2001. Within an hour, he has everything on the table. He's like, this is, this is not normal. This is not normal. This is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. But he starts to think to himself, like, something's just not right here. This, is, this can't be. It just can't be. Something's just not right. So he befriends one of the, uh, one of the people, you know, one of the, the people there. And he starts to give him a lot of stuff. He says, like, tell me the story. Like, what's going on over here? Like, something's just not right. This can't be. And I'm the king now. What's going on here? He goes, I'll tell you. The people in this town do not want to be governed by a strong king. They want a very, very weak leader. So therefore, every year they wait for the hurricane season. They wait for a shipwreck. And they wait for some guy to come. And he'll become the next king. And he's very weak because he's just like so excited that he's the king. And in exactly one year anniversary from when he becomes king, he's totally out. He's finished. We put him on a boat and he's out of here. He goes, wow, I see. I see. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, what he started at this moment was an enterprise, an exporting enterprise that you can't imagine. You just shipping out diamonds, shipping out jewelry, shipping out, you name it, cottons, linens, rugs, shipping and shipping and shipping and shipping, nonstop, nonstop. And he's the king. So he, no, no one can say it. That was the bylaw. The bylaw was you are the king. You're the king for the years. He can do whatever he wants. And nobody really knew anyone. No one really paid attention. So now what happens? The anniversary comes up. And sure enough, that day, they rip off his royal garments. They take off his thing. They, they put him in a rowboat and they just shove him in there. They say, bye. And you know what he says back to them? Bye. They're like, what's going on here? Usually the guy's crying and screaming. and No. I'm not crying and I'm not screaming. He just rose right away because he saved everything. He sent it all ahead. He sent it all ahead. When, a, when things happen in life, it's an opportunity to send it ahead. What do I mean by that? That means our nishama. We are kings over our body. We are given a soul and that soul is given a body. But it's not forever. You're not going to be king forever. It's not going to last. There's going to come a time where they're going to rip off that body and your soul's going to st still be there. The question is, what did you put away? 
What did you put away for after the 120 years? We look around and we see how life is just so, so easily just gone. We see people going up and going down, Panasa going up and going down. We see it in front of us. The Hazonish once said, I could prove to you that this world is not the final place. Because an animal is born. An animal is born with a certain brain capacity. And that brain capacity stays for their entire life. Behema is a conjunction of Ba-ma. What's in his brain is what it is. That's, it is what it is. Behema, Ba-ma. There's no growth. You, don't, you never heard of a rhinoceros working on himself to not get angry. You, just, you never heard of it before because it doesn't happen. But a human being, he's born. He's just, you know, helpless little baby. You know, what does he have? He needs his parents for everything. He needs his parents for every little thing. He can't do anything. And then he gets a little bit older and a little bit older. And he starts to make a lot of mistakes. I remember the first time my son took the car. He's 23 now. When he turned 17, he asked for the keys to the car after getting his license. And I was like, no. I was like, Dad, I have a license. Could I take the car? I'm like, I was like frozen. And my wife walked into the room. She goes, I just spoke to my best friend. She says, when your kid asks for the keys, just close your eyes, pray, and hand them the keys. Because you know what's going to happen. And sure enough, he got into that minivan. He pulled out, and we heard it. Mirror gone. I think I must have bought at least 10 to 15 secondhand mirrors in my life. But that's what it is. They make mistakes. The first Purim, you get a call from your son in yeshiva when he's 19 years old, 18 years old, 20 years old. I remember that first phone call. Daddy, I'm not drunk. Okay, good. Baruch Hashem. Daddy, I'm not drunk. Good. Daddy, I'm not drunk. Holy cow, he's drunk. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or the time the kids went, I remember one of my boys, the next uh, couple, I forgot which one, he went with a friend and I saw the car that was picking up. I said, this car is like from 1975. I don't think it's going to make it. Oh, it's going to make it. Three o'clock in the morning. Dad, could you pick me up in the Bronx? Because we were on our way to somewhere. These things happen. That's kids. Then you become like 30. You're getting a little bit smarter, but really, you're making a lot of mistakes. 40 years old, disaster. But you're getting a little bit better. You're getting smarter in business. You're learning from your mistakes. You're seeing who to, who to, who to trust and who not to trust. 50 years old, you're really starting to figure out life. 60, you just know it all, but you just can't do anything anymore because your whole body's breaking down. By 70, you are the master. By 80, you could tell anyone anything that's going to happen. They says in the Gemara, Masechet Kiddushin, that anyone who's over 70, anyone, not Jew, non-Jew, you stand up for them because it's impossible that miracles did not happen for them, for them to get to that age. So by the time you're 80, 90 years old, you, you're talking about a man, a woman who has figured out life, has developed their brain, has learned to let things go, learned how to deal with people. And what happens at that point? That's it. It's over. Says the Chazonish, could it be that's how Hashem created man? Such a cruel way? Develop yourself and then just end it? We always develop for the future. You are developing for the future. Every moment that you're in this world, that you're able to be happy, and you're able to realize that I am here to grow, and you're able to learn Torah, you're able to do mitzvot, you're able to do chesed with somebody, and you go help somebody when you don't want to do it and you work on yourself. And you're able, when someone makes a comment to you, say, you know, where is this person coming from? Maybe I could understand them a little bit better. Maybe I could help them. When you become great, you have built a treasure house. That treasure house is waiting, the treasure house is waiting for you. You know, Rabbi Kaduri, when he passed away, the moments he was passing away, there was thousands upon thousands of dollars that he gave to all of his students to give away, to give as charity because he wanted to have that uplift as he goes up because he understood that you're in this world and you have an opportunity to have treasures. There's a story of the Gaon of Vilna. He passed away also on Sukkot and he was in his Sukkot at the end of his life and he was holding onto his seat for dear life and he's crying. 
And he was saying for just pennies, for pennies, I'm carrying treasures in the next world. But it's not going to last forever. Whatever a person cooks Friday afternoon, that's what they eat on Shabbat. The things we do in this world is just one opportunity. That's it. You're stuck with it in the next world. I've said this mashal many times, but I'll say it again. Because I think it's just a powerful mashal. There's a person who wanted to see what Gan Eden looked like and what Gehenam looked like. And he went up to Shaman, they gave him the grand tour. He says, let me see first, let me, let me see Gehenam, let me see Gehenam first. He sees Gehenam, and he sees, wow, you guys see what's going on over here. Beautiful, violins playing, waiters, waitresses, food, delicious, it's a gorgeous party. And everyone's dressed nicely, he's like, this is Gehenam, like what's going on over here? After a little while, the food comes out, the hot, beautiful food, and everyone's about to eat, and they pick up their fork and knife, and they go to eat, but their arms are stuck. They're straight. They can't bend. They're trying to eat, and they just they can't do it. And that's Gehenna. They never. That's it. He says, "Can I go to Gan Eden now?" He goes to Gan Eden. It's exactly the same, the exact same scene, and the same thing. That their arms. But there was one difference. In this scene in Gan Eden, each person looked at the person across from them and with their outstretched straight arms fed the person across. Because they developed the ability to give in this world and that was with them forever. No one could take it away from you. But those who didn't develop that, they were in Gehenam. Because Gehenam is not realizing the potential you have in this world. We are here. Wherever we are, we have the most beautiful opportunity for growth every second. You're in charge of your thoughts, you're in charge of your mind, you're in charge of your eyes. You're a melech, but it's not going to last forever. Everybody has to realize that on Sukkot. You want to be happy? Just keep on sending those treasures, sending those treasures. Just, just keep on doing every word of Torah, every word of learning. I want to just give a big chazak of Baruch to, the, to, the, to those who have joined the learning we're learning twice a week, Baruch Hashem, with such fire. You can't imagine the fire of Gemana, of these men. On Shabbat, how many guys are learning in, by all the rabbis in the shul, the growth, the learning of Torah, the ladies, all the great mitzvot that they do. You have treasure. You're walking around a billionaire. That's happiness. That's happiness. And it's, everything's an opportunity. Someone throws you an insult and you say, I hear, I understand. I probably had to hear that. First of all, they don't know what hit them when that happens. And second of all, it's true. You had to hear that insult. That's okay. It's okay. Sukkot is the time. I wish everybody, from the bottom of my heart, take this advice. Realize what this world is all about. Realize the opportunity you have every second. Don't waste the opportunities. Get a mitzvah any way you can. Don't ever give up the shot to do more and more mitzvot. And the simcha you'll have. And I'll just end with one quick line from Rabbi Avigda Miller, who's right here. So Rabbi Avigda Miller, Allah shalom, zecher sadik bracha. The word for happiness in Hebrew is sameach. If you take the, sam, the, uh, the sin and you make it into a sadi, that's someyach, to grow. It's the same word, sameach and someyach. Growing people are happy people. When you're growing as a person, you're happy in anything. But the most is when it comes to your own personal character. I wish upon everybody that simha. This is the time of our simha. Tonight is a night to pray. Pray like the rabbi mentioned before. Pray for, just pray to Hashem, whatever you want. But realize that what you should want is what he wants. And what he wants more than anything is for you to earn olam haba. That's what Hashem wants. He wants to give you the ultimate gift. Don't waste this world on small things. Don't ask for small things. Go for the gusto. Go for everything. Realize the opportunity you have. And with that, I give you a beracha that Hashem should answer all your tefillot. Should go all mishalot libechem letova. And everybody should have good health. The rabbis, all the congregants should have simachot together and on good times together, and realize right now are good times. Every moment is a good time. Every second is an opportunity. 
You don't have to wait for simcha. Don't ever have a, a, a situation where you say, when that happens, I'll be happy. Do it now. Happiness comes now because every moment is an opportunity for growth. All the best. Thank you so much, Rabbi Miller, again, for the beautiful words of Chizuk and, uh, that we all need. And, and uh, really, may you have also all the berachot for yourself a wife, a kids, a whole family, Bezrat Hashem, and uh, true simcha, and beriut, uh, and shenizkele hagdil Torah olehadira, amen, keni hiratzon.